Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Welcome back. This is our second uh, uh, unit uh, guest speakers event, and uh, I'm happy to uh, welcome to the to this event uh, Daniel Ritiker from uh, the European Court of Human Rights. And what is even more interesting that it, he is not going to talk about uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, which is a shame for me, but a great benefit for everyone else. Uh, Daniel, as you can see on the, on the slide, uh, is from the University of Lausanne and uh, also from Suffolk University in Boston where he holds uh, associate positions, if I'm not mistaken. And he also uh, has a lot of publications in various aspects of international law, a uh, uh, member of International Law Association, um, I guess. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Uh, the, uh, I would like to say that uh, Daniel will speak for as long as he wants because we have this room for two hours, and uh, then uh, we can we can discuss wherever he uh, and ask questions. All right, so Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much, uh, dear Constantine, for for having me here in Liverpool uh, and for this uh, uh, exaggerated introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, dear, dear students, um, it's true that uh, I'm a senior lawyer, my profession is a, is, is a senior lawyer at the European Court of Human Rights, but uh, my passion, my, my uh, evening or night passion is, is uh, arms control, nuclear, nuclear disarmament uh, and humanitarian law and, and everything that goes with it. And uh, finally I, I, I could uh, Build a bridge between these two fields of human rights and, and um, arms control in this recent research which I published uh, last year uh, with Routledge, Humanization of Arms Control, which I started in 2014 in, 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 in uh, one of the universities in, in, in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, and um, which I published uh, last year. So, trying to to bring together two fields of international law which maybe from the outset don't have much in common but uh, fragmentation of, of international law, uh, you have heard of that, is, is, is a problem and why not trying to, to, to pull uh, several, uh, different fields together which uh, again from the outset might be quite uh, different. So. This is uh, the, uh, the topic of, of, of this afternoon, um, humanization of arms control. Huh? So, placing the individual, the victims of arms, especially uh, nuclear arms, into the center of interests. Huh? This is uh, really about uh, what I call humanization of arms control. I will uh, have two parts, I have quite a small group, this can also be something a bit more informal sooner or later on, on discussions. Uh, two parts. First of all, to introduce, of course, a bit uh, what is in this book, my my research, and in the second part, actually follow up, um, a kind of confirmation, so to speak, of of, of my of some of my thesis. Um, of course, by poor chance, uh, a couple of days after the publication of, of, of my book in July 2017, uh, ten days later, uh, in New York. Um, an important new treaty in the nuclear field, uh, the treaty on the uh, prohibition of nuclear weapons, has been adopted uh, in New York at the, at the UN premises, 7th July 2017. Uh, the book uh, I published uh, some days before, but there's a lot of, of um, confirmation of what I what I think in, in this book, what I express in the book in this new treaty. So I will talk about this uh, uh, treaty a bit uh, in the second part. As kind of confirmation of what, what I what I proposed, and uh, second, uh, also interesting uh, confirmation is that the Human Rights Committee in Geneva some days ago you might have read about this or or, or heard about this Human Rights Committee, so a human rights body, uh, 
has adopted a general comment on the right to life, number 36, and it's paragraph 66 talks about uh, nuclear disarmament and the duty of states uh, uh, to get rid of the nuclear weapons and also about how bad, of course, how bad uh, the use of nuclear weapons would be to the right to life and how much it would be contrary to this uh, right to life. Uh, in the end, I will quickly mention um, uh, <coughs> this general comment. So, why do we need new approaches to arms control and, and, and nuclear and nuclear weapons? Huh? I think there are there are many more reasons than that. Just a couple I wanted, I wanted to mention. There's basically stagnation for, for many years now in nuclear disarmament in spite of, of clear legal duties. Huh? We still have globally 15,000 15, nuclear warheads in, in the arsenals of, of the nine nuclear weapon states. UK, UK about uh, 200. Of course, the most uh, are uh, in the arsenals of, of um, U the US and, and Russia. Huh? So roughly 15,000 uh, uh, warheads, in spite of clear duties to get rid of, of, of these arsenals. Uh, NPT, non proliferation Treaty, Article 6 from 1968, huh? so 50 years ago. 50 years ago. Uh, clearly says uh, there's a duty to negotiate in good faith, in good faith, towards general and complete disarmament. Huh? But still, we have a lot um, to do. And the ICJ in '96 basically uh, confirmed this duty. There exists an obligation to pursue in good faith and to bring to a conclusion. This is important to bring to a conclusion. Huh? Negotiations leading to nuclear disarmament in all its aspects under strict and effective international control. Huh? So based, of, based on, this, on these duties and uh, the lack of implementation of these clear legal norms, uh, certain states, together with civil society, pushed uh, towards this new treaty which was adopted uh, last year and which fits very well into this uh, human-centered approach um, to arms control. So stagnation of disarmament as a first, as a first uh, reason to, to try to think out, out of the box to, to find new ideas. Tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, this is this is this goes on for many for many years. Nuclear weapons tests in, in North Korea some some years ago. Uh, repudiation of the Iran deal by the U.S. administration. I wrote repudiation because I'm not sure or lawyers are not sure if it's a violation or a withdrawal. Uh, so repudiation, I think, is a is a good term, a quite neutral term of the Iran deal by the US administration in spite of all the confirmations by the Vienna agency that uh, Iran did basically not, uh, there's no reason to believe that uh, Iran uh, violated its, its um, obligations under this uh, important deal which has been uh, established uh, during years and years of negotiations. Possibly withdrawal by the US from the, the INF treaty this is the Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Treaty of 1986, which obliges uh, Russia and the US to get rid of a certain type of nuclear uh, weapons, those which reach uh, aims between 500 kilometers and uh, 5,500 uh, kilometers. I remember that. Yes. The entire category of, of nuclear weapons would be uh, um, Destroyed. A lot has been done, and now this, this quite successful treaty uh, is now in danger because uh, Trump administration thinks it's not uh, worse anymore. Fragile uh, ge uh, geopolitical situation, in particular U.S.-Russian uh, tensions. I'm only a lawyer. Um, you, you read the newspapers, you know exactly what's going on. Fragile regimes, a bit everywhere, unpredictable uh, leaders. So many reasons, basically. To, to, to think that uh, we have to find other solutions. Unpredictable leaders everywhere uh, have, to, have to think uh, that the, the only way to, to exclude the possibility of, of that something happens by accident or by, by uh, miscalculation, by terrorist uh, attack also on, on, on the nuclear weapon, is to get rid of them entirely. So I think there are a lot of motivations to come up with new solutions, try to find new ideas. And one is, uh, so this, this book, uh, which, which takes this, this avenue of placing the individual at the center 
of, of interest. Other people have written uh, before that, but uh, I think in, in some aspects um, I came up with some added value, especially as far as this link between human rights and, and arms control um, is, is concerned. Why focusing on, 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 on the UNV? Well, uh, as Konstantin uh, mentioned, I'm uh, basically also a human rights lawyer, so I, I care. Uh, in spite of my 14 years at the European Court of Human Rights, uh, I, I still care about uh, human rights. It's on the record now. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I will show it to my colleagues. And I think, uh, especially these topics, um, nuclear weapons, uh, it's maybe not, not so much in the, in the, in the, in the head of, of students, young, young people anymore, because it's uh, far away, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And it's not a when you read these newspapers, it's like an abstract threat. It's something abstract, nuclear weapons. Okay, nobody's going to use them anyway. Huh? And, well, okay. Uh, but uh, it's something very concrete. And uh, we have victims, the Japanese victims. We have a lot of victims of nuclear testing in, 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 uh, in, uh, on the Marshall Islands, uh, semi Paladinsk region in Kazakhstan, Soviet testing uh, sites. So it's something very concrete, huh? and I think it's, it's about human dignity, about human rights, and I think this, this, this human-based approach uh, makes, makes sense and was really, uh, um, I felt it necessary to place more on, the, on this side uh, and less on, on state security um, interests. So what is humanization? What does it, uh, does it want to achieve? I said already quite a bit. Um, I think it wants to place the interest of human beings, human security, into the center of attention and, and less uh, the, the state's uh, interests or sovereignty. Of course, it, it goes hand in hand. But it wants to focus on victims, actual, future, potential victims, past victims of, of those weapons. Not only uh, nuclear. I, I did not only uh, write about nuclear uh, uh, treaties, but, but as well as, as non-nuclear. And, uh, and so to place the interest of the human being in the center, trying to achieve through this human um, being-centered uh, approach, to try to achieve nuclear disarmament, at least uh, prohibit use of nuclear weapons, which was achieved now in theory, because this treaty is not yet into force, of course, this is a new provision treaty of last year, but sooner or later, when it enters into force, to have a provision globally universal um, binding uh, uh, provision of use and other uh, duties of nuclear weapons, which did not exist before. It's quite strange. You know? we, have, we have a provision of use of, of, of uh, blinding laser weapons, of, of landmines, uh, we had uh, of chemical weapons already, of biological weapons, um, but nothing on nuclear weapons. I mean, no global uh, binding uh, provision of use of nuclear weapons. And this is uh, surprising and, and uh, it might come into force through this new treaty. So, nuclear the chief nuclear disarmament, provision of use, and assistance to victims. This new treaty um, entails a uh, clause on assistance to victims. That's quite, quite new, quite interesting. Assistance victims of nuclear testing and use of nuclear weapons. Humanization is not um, a new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. We have humanization, I call it humanization, in other areas. We talk uh, quite often now about human development instead of about only the uh, development of, of uh, states. Right? It's not only about how much, how, how big uh, is the P and P, PIP of a state. Huh? I think it's more interesting and more important for for us to know if, if uh, the human beings are actually benefiting from, from growth of, of, of the state. So I think this places the individual into the focus as well, you know, the development uh, discussion. Human security as well, security, uh, state security versus uh, individual or, or, or human security. There is clear uh, linkage between uh, human rights and security. For instance, the uh, UN Security Council has in the past said that uh, cross massive violation of human rights can constitute um, a threat 
to international peace and security. So, if the individual is threatened by by uh, by dangers, by disasters, uh, by war, then this is also having repercussions uh, on the on the global scale on, on security huh? or transfer of arms to certain states or regions where there might be uh, abuse of human rights with these arms. Uh, this is, of course, a problem of, of human security. And uh, so this is this, this new trend, not only to focus uh, security, uh, or the place security issue to the state, but also on the individual, because this is uh, actually is, uh, is linked. <coughs> so let's see the structure of, of the book. Uh, so we have these two parts. First part, first chapter, main chapter, uh, on treaties dealing with non-nuclear weapons, you know, so everything which is non-nuclear. And I, I um, assessed, examined basically the, these four treaties, the 1993 Convention on the Provision of the Development, Production, Stockpile, and Use of Chemical Weapons, and on Destruction. Then the 1997 Convention on the Provision of Use, Stockpiling, Production, and Transfer of Antipersonal Mines and on Destruction, the so called Ottawa Convention, and the 2008 Convention on Cluster Munitions, so called Oslo Convention. And a bit sui generis, a bit different, the 2013 Arms Trade Treaty. So the first three treaties are quite similar in structure, quite interesting, that, that's why it was also quite convenient to compare, because they are. Um, they want to, to prohibit an entire category of weapons. Uh, you see a uh, convention on the prohibition of the development, production, stockpiling and use, uh, with often the same uh, duties in view of complete uh, elimination of, 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 of those weapons, of chemical weapons, for instance. Uh, chemical weapons, we still have uh, uh, a lot to do, but a lot has, has also already been done. A lot of states have actually, based on this 1993 convention, get, get rid of their, of their uh, stocks. So three quite similar uh, type of treaty, which actually uh, are the basis also were the basis for the new treaty on nuclear weapons last year. Uh, it's quite quite uh, um, uh, surprising or quite quite interesting to to observe that these three treaties on their structure substance. Uh, were uh, good examples for this uh, new treaty on the provision of nuclear weapons uh, of last year. So today we have prohibition on chemical weapons, landmines, uh, cluster munitions, and uh, since the last year, not yet enforced this, this nuclear weapons uh, treaty, which I'm going to explain a bit later. And we have this 2013 arms trade treaty, which is quite quite special. Right? It's, it's not going to um, prohibit an entire category. It's more duties of states to um, forbid, to hinder uh, exports of, of certain weapons, rifles, you know, light weapons, to states, to regions where they might be used for uh, cross violation, massive violation of human rights, humanitarian law, or uh, war crimes. Uh, so this is uh, more like a duty of the states to make sure that nothing is, is being delivered to those states. So quite a different um, Quite a different uh, type of duty, but very much also um, inspired by this humanitarian uh, spirit. Huh? So it was not so difficult for this first part, for these non-nuclear treaties, to see that here we talk really more about humanitarian law, human-based uh, uh, considerations, than security. Maybe the first one is, is in between uh, chemical weapons. Uh, when they, it was adopted, it took like 30 years to adopt this treaty, the chemical weapons uh, treaty. It was considered to be important for, for state security, uh, these chemical weapons. And of course, it's also, it's also terrible for the, for the victims. Now we see it in Syria, uh, uh, kids and, and, and innocent women and men, civilians are, are, are uh, injured or killed by, by those weapons. So the first thing they would say, between uh, state security, be, be, between uh, like old uh, Cold War considerations and new type of treaty like the anti-personal mines and cluster munitions, uh, which are, uh, I think, the, the delegates, the states, are aware that those weapons are basically not very important for, for military uh, purposes, so it was easier actually to get, uh, to get the provision on, on those. And here we talk really more about humanitarian law treaties than, than uh, classical arms control treaties. Yeah? This made it quite easy 
for this first category in the first chapter, to see that humanization of arms control already happened in, this, in these fields. And what is also important, but also uh, underlined in my book, that this, uh, especially the Ottawa and the Oslo uh, Convention, but also the 8080 arms treaty, of the really like, um, initiated, backed up by civil society, by NGOs, and by certain states. Uh, and, uh, same thing for the, for the last year's treaty on nuclear weapons, ICANN, the International Campaign for the, uh, for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons, which got the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize uh, this year, I, th I think I have to say last, last year, uh, for, for, this, uh, for this treaty, shows clearly that we're talking here about treaties which have been pushed especially by uh, civil society. Part two, uh, dealing uh, with nuclear weapons. There it was a bit uh, more difficult from the outset to, to find um, human-centered or, or uh, human conservation for, for the adoption of, of these treaties. And um, mo most of the treaties which I considered the most important which ex exist in the field are going quite back in time, going back to the Cold War where uh, the human element played less a role, but where the concentrations of, of sovereignty, of states, was, 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 more, uh, was more important. So we have the 1963 treaty banning nuclear weapons tests in the atmosphere, in outer space, and underwater, right? the so-called partial test ban treaty, or Moscow treaty, so quite an old treaty, uh, where we had at least, I think in the preamble, we talk about uh, protection of environment, right? Uh, see that uh, this uh, mushroom clouds of, of the testing uh, was visible for everybody, of course, and uh, uh, triggered a lot of critique among uh, society, and that, that's why I think it was, it was um, I think this, this critique, this international critique by civil society made, made their uh, important uh, contribution to the adoption of this treaty. You know? 1968 treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, NPT. I think here is a treaty which is, has nothing uh, to say about uh, the human being. I think it's really more like a state uh, security driven, uh, driven treaty. 1996 comprehensive test ban treaty, not yet into force. Right? This is also uh, a treaty which is uh, um, on nuclear testing, but more comprehensive, unfortunately. Um, to, to a very um, complicated entry to force clause, in, in, in spite of the fact that 180, I think 180 or 180 uh, states have ra actually ratified this treaty, it's not yet in the force right? because it, it demands the, um, the ratification of certain, certain states, the so called nuclear cap capables, you know? and uh, uh, certain states. Uh, Capable nuclear uh, capables like India, Pakistan, if I'm not uh, confusing, and the US also uh, have not yet ratified, and that's why the entry the force is blocked for many, for many years only. So here also a uh, test ban, uh, also partially uh, driven by conservation of humanity, Greenpeace uh, has has uh, pushed forward to national memoria. Of, of nuclear testing. So there we have uh, an influence, I, I write about this, also in, in Kazakhstan, around Semipalatinsk, uh, there was a movement, popular movement, by a, a Kazakh uh, poet, at the <coughs> Nevada Semipalatinsk movement, grassroots movement, which was actually uh, uh, pushing forward to have moratoria in, in the Soviet Union. And then, uh, this is often forgotten, so we have these three uh, treaties, which are more or less uh, sometimes inspired by uh, human uh, conservations, uh, but much less than, than uh, in the older field, which is surprising because uh, here we talk about the most, the most um, uh, dangerous uh, weapon uh, existing. And then we have uh, five treaties, and this is quite interesting, on the denuclearization of certain regions, so-called nuclear weapon-free zones. And uh, I think I have a small uh, map, very uh, visible, where you have, you can see that uh, entire uh, continents, um, Latin America, um, Africa, for instance, are already uh, 
have been already bound by by, uh, by this nuclear uh, treaty, so by prohibition, not to use, not to possess, not to transfer nuclear weapons. Huh? Well, the entire uh, Latin America or Africa or Central Central Asia since the semi Paladins Treaty and Southeast uh, region of the Southeast of Asia and the Pacific, South Pacific are entirely uh, free from nuclear weapons. Uh, and what's interesting, so for many years, uh, uh, sometime, and what's really interesting is that the nuclear weapon states can, uh, by ratification of protocols, they can guarantee or they can commit not to use nuclear weapons against those, those states which are bound by this, by this um, uh, treaties. Uh. So for instance, the Russia guaranteed not to use nuclear weapons through the semi Paladins Treaty, of 2006 against uh, one of the, I think, five member states of, of the uh, Central Asia nuclear weapon uh, zone. Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Turkmenistan. And so, like mini prohibition treaties on the regional level. Huh? And uh, five of them, and uh, Mongolia, for instance, declared itself also uh, uh, nuclear weapons free. Uh, mini treaties, which are more than 100, uh, cover more than 100 states. Yeah. So I think this helped a lot for the new treaty, for the new treaty uh, to be adopted last year, like the global, the global treaty. And of course, in, in these treaties, sometimes in the preamble, Pelindaba Treaty, uh, you find some references to uh, interest of, of uh, future or actual generations of, of the human being. Yeah. But still, it, it's it's. Uh, quite quite a way. <laughs> so this is basically what I, I covered in this um, in the second part, which a treatise I was studying, and one of the main chapters, and maybe there also lies the, the uh, added value of, of the book of my research, is that I try to assess the, the impact uh, the impact of the use of nuclear weapons on the human being and, and its uh, legal consequences. So basically two, two parts, the use of nuclear weapons in light of uh, international humanitarian law, which has already been done by other authors quite a bit uh, before, and, and the second, uh, later, the second um, run on uh, human rights law. And human rights law, nuclear weapons, uh, in light of human rights law, has been uh, done much less. The focus was really more on international humanitarian law. I think uh, if I would have to summarize the, the main uh, value of the book, I would, I would focus it there. Uh, that I, I studied the impact of nuclear weapons on, on the, uh, uh, human rights. So as far as uh, the use of nuclear weapons in light of uh, IHL is concerned, you, you, might, you might be familiar with this uh, 96 uh, ICJ opinion on the guarantee of threat or use of nuclear weapons, uh, the same which I, which I already mentioned before, which was a bit, um, I would say, unfortunate, um, a bit unclear. There the court said that uh, generally use of threat of nuclear weapons would generally be contrary uh, to international law, in particular uh, the war of warfare of, of humanitarian law. Uh, of the principle of distinction, for instance, because in nuclear weapons they don't distinguish between uh, a civil population and, and um, military objectives, for instance. And the court said in the end that uh, the court cannot conclude definitely whether the threat or use of nuclear weapons would be lawful or unlawful in an extreme circumstance of self-defense in which the very survival of a state would be at stake. Uh, would be, cannot conclude defi definitely whether the threat or use of nuclear weapons would be lawful or unlawful in an extreme circumstance of self-defense in which the very survival of a state would be at, at stake. Uh, a lot of things have been written since then about, about this uh, sentence. So it, court didn't want to, to uh, close the door uh, to the use of nuclear uh, weapons entirely. Mm. And then, so 1996, more than 20 years ago, now since then, I covered this in my book, there have 
been a lot of new evidence, especially the last uh, couple of, of years, for the destructive power of nuclear weapons and for the inability to assist victims of nuclear uh, explosions. In order to establish this new treaty, which was adopted last year, 2017, several conferences have, have been um, studying the question of, of the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. Uh, we had a conference in Oslo, Nayarit, and Vienna, which, uh, during which uh, new facts and uh, new research has been presented uh, on the question how 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 bad how how negative the impact would be on the on the human being on, on the on the globe on the earth uh, more globally. So and a lot of, of new research has been <coughs> has been shown. This is just one of of, of, of those. You can do that uh, if you, if you uh, want to do that on Liverpool or on, on uh, somewhere else. You can find this on the internet. Nuke map. You can try it out with, with your uh, hometown if it's not Liverpool, uh, and you can you can enter the uh, the, the point where the, where the nuclear weapon would, uh, would fall, and then you have a more or less an idea how the structure it would, would be. Uh, here I, I just took Liverpool because we're Liverpool. <laughs> Sorry about that. And, um, and this is a, a small bomb. This is the, the Hiroshima bomb, little boy, 15 uh, kilotons, which is really very small. Uh, compared with, with, the, with the weapons we have today. And just to see, uh, to show you that uh, this little bomb, how many uh, fatalities or injuries it would, it would cause. Huh? Uh, and how, how much the, the blast, the heat, and, and uh, the detonation, the fire would, would, would uh, impact on the human being. Here, something, uh, the, still your pool, no? but we have to, we have to, uh, to take another, another uh, uh, measure. Here we have um, the, the B-83, which is the largest bomb in the current U.S. arsenals, just 1.2 uh, megatons, which is like uh, 100 times more powerful than, than, uh, than what we had in, in Hiroshima. And this is a reality. It's not about uh, only about the small bombs uh, in Hiroshima. We have much more powerful bombs these days in the in the arsenals. And here you can see, compared with this um, number before, here we have uh, 36,000 um, fatalities uh, in the first couple of months. A lot would would, uh, be, uh, would have to be added after certain years because of um, Radiation sickness. Uh, this is just a, a tool to show, demonstrate how, how about what we are talking here. We talk about uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, so a lot has been demonstrated in the last uh, couple of years on the impact on on the um, nuclear weapons on inhabited cities. Uh, uh, how bad this would would be. So it means that this 1996 um, advisory opinion of the ICJ, I wrote in this book, in a book that it would have to be a uh, question. So this, 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 this open door to nuclear weapons, from my point of view, with all the new evidence we have, I think we would maybe come to another uh, conclusion uh, today. So first part, the national humanitarian law, now human rights law. Huh? As I said, it's a bit surprising that uh, Nothing much has been written before uh, about nuclear weapons and human rights. Probably because all the authors, there were not many anyway, but the authors which have been studying these questions were of opinion that, well, we have a jail which is anyway the lex specialis compared to the human rights law. But I think it's, it's a bit too simple to argue uh, like that. And I, I um, identified several points, there are many more probably, uh, mm -hmm. which are in favor or which, which uh, give an added value to human rights law compared to other branches of, of um, um, international law. For instance, human rights law is basically applicable, basically applicable, and I can discuss it afterwards, in all circumstances. So we don't have to ask ourselves this, this tricky question of threshold, of, of do we have an armed conflict already or not? Huh? Uh, so is there a threshold of, of a nuclear, uh, of, of an uh, armed conflict in, in the sense of the um, Geneva Protocols and Conventions already reached or not? 
in Resto, basically applicable in all circumstances. Yeah? You don't have these thresholds uh, applicability or not. Positive obligations, I think this is uh, something uh, interesting in, in Resto. State is not only uh, does not only have to refrain from, from interference into one's rights, but also sometimes has to, to be has to be proactive and um, protect the human being against environmental catastrophes, for instance, against uh, killing uh, by uh, of some other private person. And I think this fits well in, in the picture of, of nuclear weapons. You can imagine that. You know, can be argued that the state has to make sure that no, no, under human rights law as well, that no uh, terrorist can can get hand on hold on uh, nuclear weapons arsenal and uh, detonate them against against the city, for instance, in the UK. Yeah? So this positive obligation to protect the uh, human beings can be used as an argument, from my point of view, yeah? to say that maybe the best way to do that would be to get rid of its its own weapons. Positive obligations. It's usual dimension, of course. I, 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 as a lawyer of the European Court of Human Rights, I'm well aware. Well, we can't uh, we can't uh, solve all the problems of uh, in the world. You agree? Uh, but we have a, we have a solid institution, and we are of course not the only one in the world. I mentioned the Human Rights Committee. Uh, there are a lot of courts out there, national, international human rights courts, regionals. Uh, which um, are competent to deal with uh, um, allegations of human rights violations. Mm. Particular nature of certain rights uh, is also something which uh, has to be uh, flagged. Uh, often, provision of torture, for instance, is considered a, a use Kogan's norm, uh, also a ominous a duty, uh, right to life, it's already more comp uh, complicated here. But certain uh, human rights are so important to be considered like um, use Kogans, like uh, you can't derogate uh, against against them. Concentration on vulnerable groups, I think, is also something um, very useful. Yeah, under human rights law, there's a the trend, I think, to, to focus now on, on, on uh, people which are more vulnerable.